Now, what I've prepared for you is this presentation. And in this presentation, I'm going to take you across these five topics. First and foremost, I want you to learn about the science behind sales. Next one, I want to talk to you, why do we need it right now? Why do, um, third and fourth, what is the impact and how do we implement it? When I built a sales organization, and many of you, I saw some people are at 2 million ARRs, uh, recurring revenue, some million people are at 20 million, some people have not even started yet. What you find is that most sales organizations, like the building of a building uh, or, or a 20 story apartment complex, when you build the 20 story apartment complex, you actually have an architecture, you have a design person who is involved in designing that properly. That's not how startups start. Startups in generally start by, hey, let me hire some sales superstars to see how it goes. And slowly but surely, over time, they start adding building blocks to it. With every new VP of sales that they hire, in generally a new form, some, some of this falls apart and gets rebuilt. For example, a new sales VP may, may result in a new sales methodology or new tools being used, new people coming in. This structure is so unorganized in many organizations that even when they reach 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars in revenue, it still is chaos. You may think it's not, but let me tell you, just having a bunch of sales stages in the form of a CRM process, that is not a properly designed sales organization. That is just a start, it's an element, but it's not just what that is about. What you see down here is the result of this, and generally, if you look at it, you find in generally that there are always a few of the same building blocks. These building blocks are not by accident. These same building blocks always occur. We have people, we have tools, we have skills, we have enablement and we have processes. These are five of the same building blocks you see in every marketing and sales organization coming back to you. What we do, however, is what you see is when you build that, most sales organizations build it starting by hiring the people. Now, what I'm going to talk to you about today is what if that pyramid is wrong upside down because the, fa the faster I grow, the more things I tack on top of it, the more unstable it becomes. Some of you may know that the average life cycle of a uh, VP, what is it, uh, let me see. Who knows what the average lifetime is of a VP of sales in the Bay Area? How many we, uh, 1.7 years. 1.7 years is close, yeah, that's close enough that I'll take it for sure. 1.65, <laughs> there we go, we'll take it. It's about 1.7 year, that's you know, like it's, um, 18 months, 19, 20 months in that range. And so it's 1.7 years. And so if I have an organization that's built and a VP of sales structure is a pull that VP of sales out, it is not uncommon that the organization has to do a reset, new methodology. That we need to bring to what we say a science culture. If you want to build a restaurant that you say, first I'm going to hire the cook, and then I'm going to, as a restaurateur, I'm going to buy everything around it, build around it, we're going to be an Italian restaurant because I hired an Italian cook. Most likely you wouldn't do it that way, unless you got the world's best Italian cook. I get that. Great. Lucky you. Everybody else first decides what restaurant they're going to build and what they're going to cater to, and then they're bringing in the cook associated with that restaurant. Sales organizations generally don't do this. What we see more in this, in this culture is that when in this superstar culture that we currently are seeing in most sales organizations, if the numbers are not met, if we fail, then in generally we blame the people. That is not an exception. That is the absolute norm across 99% of all companies. Goals are, met, are not met. First, first people we're going to talk to is what's wrong with the people? Did the VP of sales fail? Did the salespeople fail? Did the lead management crew fail? We want to blame people. What you see down here is fixing the people in this organization is essentially not the way to solve it. Every person that you hire and fire and generally leads to a six to nine month delay on that entire process, firing and hiring is just, it's gonna take that long. What we also see in this process, in this more superstar driven culture, that anything associated with tools and skills are all focused on, no, 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 are all focused on optimizing. May I have that note? May I have a uh, uh, spare notebook? Does anybody have a spare notebook? No, no, I'll take care of you. There you go. <laughs> and so what we also see is that in many of these cases, all these are focused on solving the problem of the person. Give me a tool that helps to make my person better. It's the wrong approach, which ends up in many cases that you have 80 to 100 tools on your tool stack. 
and you know, like we have three tools for person X, four tools for person Y, and it becomes a mess of the amount of SaaS service tools that you have. In order to run a proper structured organization, your tools are there to make sure that the process gets properly implemented. And then we teach the people on how to operate the tool to execute the process properly. This is a reverse approach. Now, we're not the first organization who runs into this. Many organizations have, have run into this before. Um, there's a great 14-page PDF white paper on this. It's public white paper, and it's done by James Reason. He says, look, if you keep running into issues, then most likely it is a process issue that you're having and not a people issue. Many industries, you know, different industries have all used this, uh, this approach, anywhere from the military, doctors, hospitals, use this approach of it is a process issue, we need to look at it differently than, than it is when we're solving, trying to solve a people issue. Do you have a question, ma'am? Who's going to build the process? That's exactly right. Uh, if you build a house, how do you get to know really how well how to build a house? You're building your first house. If you built your first house, will that be the best house you've ever built? Probably not, because probably you come to the conclusion that the, fun, fun, the foundation that you, that you developed was not strong enough to sustain the second, the third, and the fourth story that you wanted to put later on. So you have to go to a person who's done processes properly before. Now, processes are not complicated. Um, they just need to be designed properly, X before Y before C. Going to a superstar to design a process gives you the right elements, but not the right, right behavior. Superstars are proving to work in pretty much any environment. You know, you know, so goes the rule, you put them in the middle of Africa with 10 bucks, they show up like three weeks later in London and they have like, you know, like brought back all kinds of gifts and treasures from their trips. That's what makes these people a superstar. Superstars are able to go through, red, through the red tape of a machete. They can. It just doesn't scale. Now, I can learn from the best practices from superstars. They just don't always apply when I start scaling the business model. The toughest part of superstars is they're very rare. And when I say rare, let's say one in a hundred, one in a two hundred. Unfortunately, most people who come and interview for a job, they think they're that one of the 200 or the one of the 100. So everybody thinks that they're a superstar, but they're not necessarily are. What does this science culture consist of? How do I can, can repeat, a, you know, how can I create a more repetitive process that brings us results? Looks at four different steps. You need to have a process and primarily the process needs to allow you to make iterative improvement. If I start to see something doesn't go, out, go right, let me fix it. For example, if I send an outbound email and nobody responds to that outbound email that I sent to a thousand people, maybe I shouldn't try to send that same outbound email to the next 1,000 people. Common methodology. What we find is that if we talk to marketing, sales, customer success, every role, that if I ask the sales organization, which methodology do you subscribe to, to talking to your customers, they may say something like consultative selling. Maybe they say challenger sales. Maybe they say spin selling. If I ask the marketing organization, which methodology do you subscribe to? They may say, oh, we're using a freemium model or we account-based marketing. They have a specific methodology. And if I go ask the customer success organization, which methodology do you subscribe to? Per today, there's not a lot of methodology. Most people will mention a tool company like a Gainsight or a Totango as part of their, their methodology. That means we got every part of the organization that's communicating with the customer in generally operating of a different methodology. When the company is small, that kind of works because everybody's sitting at the same round table talking to each other. But as soon as that company starts to grow and walls are created and people are moving to different rooms, we find that the lack of a common methodology causes all kinds of issues. Third part is data driven. We need this organization to be data-driven because it essentially avoids the, the problem between marketing and sales. This is most common as like, who's responsible for the MQLs? Marketing says, I gave you 2,000 marketing qualified leads. Sales says, do you call those marketing qualified leads? I don't know what they're called, but I called the phone list to me, right? So we get this stress point in the organization. What we often, what we see is like when we bring, bring the data out, 
the data doesn't lie, so to speak. We simply represent the data, and both parties are not opposite of each other again. They're sitting on the same side of the table looking at the data. Data creates both accountability and, and clarity. Last one, you don't see this a lot in most of these uh, uh, talks. Team provides scalability. What we have known in sales all along is that sending one person on a cruise to the Caribbean and call that President's Club because they performed is essentially works against the nature of the team. To be singling out one person who gets to go on a cruise works very well against the other nine people who worked in some ways equally hard on that deal. Obviously, we can say, well, the comp plan is structured, the financial risk is there, I get that. Still, there's nine people who are looking at that person when they come back with a tan, go like, did you have a fun time, right? And so we find that in order to scale, we need to look at team performance and sometimes supersede that over individual performance. Now, what we see down here, you know, what is a science called culture, process, methodology, and data? I'll use that simple and then team because it didn't fit on the line. Uh, I know method and methodology are not the same. I'm just running out of characters on the end of that slide, so I just abbreviated it, so bear with me there. Now, you know, like one of the things that I found working with many companies is that in generally, most enterprise companies and most successful companies, not the B2C, I saw a few B2C uh, companies in here, you do not experience this at that point. B2B companies experience what they call the Pareto Principle. And the Pareto Principle, does anybody know what the Pareto Principle stands for? 20, and what is it, 20 to 80, so help me out, what is, help so they don't hear my voice. What does 20 to 80 mean? That's right. And it comes from Italy, in Italy, where 20%, 80% uh, of the land was owned by 20% of, of the people. They found that out. Enterprise sales has not only you know, like, um, used that, it essentially it is built on that. Comp plans are structured like that. That's how accelerators work. I'm willing to pay a few people a lot of money if they help, help to get me a quota. Now, I know I want everybody to get a quota, but it simply is not possible. 20% of the people generate 80% of the revenue. That means that the other 80% who doesn't hit quota actually pays for that 20%. That's how comp plans are structured. The problem is that this works extremely well with high dollar sales. If you have a one-off product that sells and you sell it a you know, quarter million dollars and you can afford to pay your salesperson 10% of that sale uh, of that dollar fi figure, then that salesperson doesn't have to close a lot of deals a year in order to make some money. That works. The problem is, as soon as we lower that price and we start to go from 250, dollars $500,000 deals to $10,000 and $5,000 deals or $200 a month, $100 a month, there is just not enough money to go around to pay these superstars anymore. And what you find is you find it happens in reverse. 80% of the revenue now gets to be produced by 80% of the people. Truth be told, it's, like, it's probably more like 70%, but it doesn't look as cool when you can reverse it, so I just reversed it. <laughs> okay, and so what you see down here is the 2080 turns into the 8080. This is very common. This happens everywhere. Instead of building a, a fully manually created uh, uh, car that was you know, like hammered, put together, which is the left world, I've now created a manufacturing line in sales. That's the nature of this. That's okay. What we have is we haven't shifted our processes, our hiring, recruiting, our tool set in order to this. We still operate and believe that in many cases this, this, this model is the right model. Recruiting hasn't radically changed. Comp plan hasn't radically changed. The way how we interview people hasn't radically changed. The way how we educate people hasn't radically changed. We still train them on negotiating and closing and pitching. Yet everything else has changed. Now, one thing I want to point out to you, which I didn't put on the slide, but I want you to realize, if I sell this Dutsky down here a million dollars, what's your name? Monty. Monty, because otherwise I keep calling you Dutsky and that you know, has a tendency to wear out. <laughs> Monty. So I'm selling Monty. Monty is the buyer of a million dollars. I'm selling a million dollars. Okay? Now, I know I'm the, smart person, the smarter person in this room, so I know like Monty actually doesn't know that the software I'm about to sell him, that he still needs, you know, like, a few weeks to get that figured out. But by the time I sell him, 
it is a perpetual license. Okay? Now, I sell this software to him. What happens if I sell him a multi-million dollar uh, piece of software, perpetual software, install whatever Cisco routers, whatever it is, I sell him something, the product ship, revenue gets recognized, I get paid. What do people think about me at the office? Just sold a million dollar piece of software. Superstar, yeah! See it? That Jocko, he can sell ice to Eskimos, <laughs> right? Now this customer, it ends up Monty, the software breaks. Who, blame, who does the customer blame? Who does his management blame? Him, Him? Monty. <laughs> Risk, super high. Risk for me selling, super low. <laughs> this is where terms like shelfware come from and door stoppers. I sold somebody $400,000 worth of boxes that ended up as door stoppers. They were so upset with me in that point in my career selling them that they literally used them as door stoppers, which means you open the door and took pictures, and then shot pictures over at me to let me know what they were using with the equipment that I sold them. And then they brought in Cisco and they show like, yeah, we use them as door stoppers right now. That's how it was. Risk, very, very low for us as a seller. Risk, very, very high. In SaaS, in recurring sales, that risk has flipped because I still face the risk that that software comes back. I still have to expense customer success resources to it. My point of profit may be 12, 18, 24 months out. I still need to invest. Risk flipped. Very critical to understand that in, in recurring sales, there has dramatic things uh, changed. Now, in this picture, you may think, oh, this is a common thing, everybody must know this. Folks, we wrote an article on this in, a, in a Harvard Business Review. It's my first article that got published in Harvard Business Review. I'm like, I, I hear it will publish the next day. I'm going to take my wife to dinner. I'm thinking I'm Will Smith who discovered the, the brain uh, thing from football, right? I'm like celebrating with my wife. I'm like, this is going to be the most. Tomorrow, I'm going to be renowned. This, is going to be, this article will publish. It's a complete change. I'm like so happy. I'm like, who cannot agree with this basic science? First comment on the article that gets sent in. First comment, you can look it up. HBR, look, Google HBR Jocko. This is the first comment. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I'm like, can we take it offline quickly? Like, can we, re like, what did I get wrong? You have to understand the alpha nature of the sale is a culture that is deeply ingrained and cannot just be challenged. I just recently did another blog post on my LinkedIn. I cannot tell you how many hate uh, messages you get on top of it. Obviously nowadays there's many supporters so they took care of that. I don't have to pick, pick my own fights anymore. But oh my gosh, letting people believe that sales actually has a process and that there's a science to it is very offensive to a lot of sales professionals. Um, what we see that revenue has shifted from a perpetual sale, whether that is hardware or, or um, software, it's shifted that in generally in a hardware sale or in a software perpetual sale, 75% will be perceived as, as monetizable in the first 30 to 60 days. Doesn't mean that payment terms sometimes shifted out 90 days, you get the point. That additional 25% sale is additional services that get sold. Obviously, if you have a 20% UNS support, you can actually c create a recurring model out of that, which is the his history uh, of how they create a recurring model. Today with SaaS sales, we notice that most of the profit comes far and deep into the future. The profit. The profit comes into the future because you first have to make your return on your investment whole. And at $50 a month, it may take a few months. Or if you sell a, you know, like a CRM software platform that was integrated and all, it may take you several months. What we see here and what we have to realize is that buying and selling has radically changed when we talk about recurring revenue. But the rest of the infrastructure has not. The way how I depict this is we're essentially trying to build a 20-story apartment complex on the, fund fun the foundation of a one carport garage. That is essentially, and we constantly see it crumble and fall and we're trying to get it back. And it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't. There is a very, very simple science behind it and there's a very simple science behind recurring sales. What we see and what I'm trying to depict down here is that over the past 
20 to 30 years, there's a particular case of how people are looking at different forms of, of sales. So I'm going to describe them. I'm going to make you an advanced um, expert in sales by this simple presentation. There's three phases I'm going to go through on the left to start off with. I call this, oh shit, I have a problem. I'm sitting somewhere and I come to the conclusion, I have a problem. Next one is, hey, there are solutions to my problem. And the third one is, hmm, this company can really help me. Give you an example, I'm at the Hilton at the uh, London Heathrow, no, sorry, at the Paddington train station. I'm at the Hilton. As I walk out of Paddington, the cab driver tells me, as I want to get to the London Heathrow, tells me, Jocko, well, he said, mister, I'm not going to take you there. I'm like, excuse me, what? He says, well, the I-5, whatever, block, major accident, you're going to be bickering and moaning in the back of my car. Bickering? What's bickering mean? Okay, bickering and moaning in the back of my car, and you're not going to make it there. Oh, shit, I have a problem. That Hilton has a concierge outside, walks over to me and says, excuse me, what are you trying to do? And I'm like, I'm trying to get to the airport. And he says, why did you take public transport, the London Heathrow Express? Aha! Solution. As I walk down and I buy my ticket, what I notice is that the ticket is about a, a quarter of, it was 18 quid, I believe, for that ticket. And they get me there faster. You know, like it was an incredible experience. And I go like, wow, why didn't I know this before? I go and understand the problem. I'm looking for solutions. And in the end, I'm looking for the, the final solution. In this mode, solution selling, I'm primarily interested in two things, price and features. That's what I'm interested in. Solution selling, good thing. Don't, I'm not saying you shouldn't be solution selling. I'm saying when you get into that mode, solution sell away. If your engineering department took 15 man years in order to develop that feature, and that's the feature to differentiate you over the competitor, in that mode, sell it. However, you can't rely on people coming to you. Sometimes you need to go out and get them. And in this case, what we do, consultative selling, we go out, RFPs, RFQs, we scour what is, a, what is available, when it's federal, what is available for quotation, and we go after that. In consultative selling, one of the primary techniques I'm using is I'm trying to figure out what your problem is, and I'm not assuming that you kind of like really, really know what your problem is. So I'm going to ask you a few questions because I'm the expert, consultative selling. And then in the last part, what we see very popular in B2B sales is a technique that nowadays often is, uh, has been popularized or known under the popular term challenger selling. This is the technique where I'm telling you what your, what your problem is. Innovative solutions really use this last technique. And in this last technique, I cannot expect that the company uh, is able and willing to already understand the problem to which my innovative solution is five years ahead of its time. I cannot rely on that. And so what I have to do, I have to make sure that in the provocative sales methodology, let me tell you what your problem is. Let me tell you what the problem is that you're having and what the impact of that is. Those three have governed for the past decade, 20, 30 years, decade for provocative selling, the previous 20 was consultative selling, and before that was solution selling. They governed most of the B2B sales and the transaction solution underneath it, the transactional part for most of the consumer space. Then came inside selling. And inside selling says, well, what if I combine the provocative approach up front? I have a group of new people, young people, they call up and they call up, so let's say a CRM company saying like, look, you're currently buying SAP at a million dollar, you know, a million dollar up front. Why don't I offer it to you at thousand dollars a month or $2,000 a month, AKA the sales that we now recognize as the model that um, uh, Salesforce, Marketo and so on come along. As soon as that I've created a provocative interest, I then push that in an organization of which the primary goal of the salesperson is get me a meeting online. And as soon as I have the meeting with that person, then I do a demonstration, maybe a little bit of discovery in between, and then I start the process. That green line primarily is get them to onboard as quickly as they can with the software. This primarily, this model has what is, most SaaS companies still use this today. This model modern uh, governs almost every SaaS organization. I got marketing who's provoking out there. I got an inside sales rep, an SDR, sales development rep, who calls people, do you want to meet with me? Do you want to meet with me? I have an AE who then follows up on a meeting, disco demo, move them into a meeting, and I got a CSM who does the onboarding. Three letter acronym, heaven for me and hell for you. Okay, this inside sales model is what currently, like I said, runs in most SaaS organizations. The problem is, some of these things didn't work. 
What we learned from this, the things that work really well is the provocative prospecting. Talking to a customer and saying, you're doing it wrong right now. That works, elements of that work. The use of specialized roles really work well. Hey, why don't I optimize one person who's just focused on sending outbound emails and getting a meeting? Elements of that work well. The first data-driven nature, testing which emails work, A-B testing, using tools like a sales loft and an outreach to, to measure response rate work really well. Use of online selling, using tools like Zoom, and instead of flying to the customer day in, day out, actually meeting them online. Content as the outbound call, instead of, try, instead of like uh, calling and just pitching you, why don't I publish blog posts and draw that attention? I'm using content as my outbound call. And finally, customer onboarding. The onboarding of a customer step by step to get them to do this. What didn't work very well? These disparate methodologies. Which methodology does sales use and so on? Volume-based called outbound. Let me send another thousand emails and see if it works. No dudskis. The response rate was 2%, I get that, but you destroyed your database by 40%. Are you aware of that? The low cost unskilled people in a critical role. If I am using my SDR to call on CXOs and they are not skilled to do their job, I'm essentially taking my name off the list of that, of that particular company. The use of consultative sales methodology by itself was fine, but the exclusive use of it was a problem and the customer success to grow business from existing clients. We found that customer success primarily were people who just want to help other people. They're unskilled and untrained to sell. They can if we would train them, they just never got to train the training. Now, what we see is, there is a f there's another element there that you can find. Second, I'm gonna come back and say like, hey, here's where all the profit is generated and generally with a form of recurring revenue. And what we are seeing that is missing is a methodology that goes end to end, is a single and uniform customer centric based methodology. A methodolo methodology where we are not talking about reeling customers in and bringing in trophies and treating them with wart like terminology. We are carpet bombing the database. Um, you know, like, and as you see me, if you're on my LinkedIn, I, every now and then you find me correcting itself. Let's create a kill list. You know, like all these things, like folks. That is not a good way to talk about those who you are dependent on for your future. So we believe that this methodology needs to be customer centric from the words that we speak and how we look at it. To give you this very simple and practical example, I promise you a purchase order by the 31st of whatever, no, 28th of, of, of February. I promise you a purchase order because I needed that as a customer. <coughs> Because by March 15th, I needed to launch your service. But I, I got you to give me a discount. So the salesperson calls me up on March 1st and says, where's my purchase order? You promised it to me. Almost every salesperson responds with that. First thing they ask me, hey, didn't we agree to a purchase order and you just broke the bond of trust and I gave you a discount, but you were supposed to send me. Why? The point of view from the salesperson is, you owed me a purchase order. Sales-centric. Customer-centric is, Oh my gosh, you missed that window. Did your date shift? Did you no longer need to be on the air by March 15th? Because, and why? Oh, but I didn't get your purchase order. I, you know, like that, I thought that we needed to be on a different point of view. Approaching that from a customer-centric point of view almost always leads to a better result. Yes, there are some industries that says, you know what, we need to be like gunner, you know, we need to be close, close, close. I got that, transactional business works like that. Most B2B businesses don't work like that, and especially recurring, because we do not close down here, people. This is not a close. We call this commit because two parties commit to the second part of that journey. Okay. <clears throat> what you see is why do we need it right now? The current model is not working. It is lacking several traditional elements, and this is the part where we have started to step in and say, like, you know what? We can do better than that. What you see down here is we started to approve with the scientific model, like any scientific model, first and foremost, can we just agree to what we call things when we call them? Now, I don't need you to know all these abbreviations and all I want you to know is like, hey, there's measurement points and maybe we should know what we're measuring there and maybe we should learn the different metrics. So I'm gonna give you a quick heads up on data. There's volume metrics, how many leads, how many deals. There's conversion rates. What did it took from one conversion metric to another? And how much time did it take? I got volume metrics, I got conversion metrics, and I got times. 
Based on these three th things, we can literally diagnose a customer. I, you know, like I would say, on average, I probably diagnose two to three customers a day. People come to me, and all I ask if they have the right model, I try to get this data, and very quickly I can determine what's going on. I'll give you an example. Down here, traditional conversion rate at a certain price, this traditional conversion rate down here, I got MQL to SQL is 20%, traditionally. Okay, that's what it is. This conversion rate here, traditionally, we use the win rate, I'll just summarize that. I win one out of every four here. However, I don't have 20% down here, I have 60% down here. I have people in the, the prospecting team telling me, oh my gosh, look at how good of a meeting we're setting up, 60%. Instead of 20, this is radically higher. And as a result, the win rate is radically lower, 12%, 10%. Customer comes to me and says like, I got a winning issue here. All right, people are not winning, look at, the, look at the conversion rate, 12%. I go like, <laughs> you don't have a winning issue. What you have is you have a qualification issue down here and potentially a handoff issue. Two conversion rates gives you way more data. What we see, if the win rate is really high, but the churn rate later on is really low, I may have fired the wrong person because I fired the person with the lower win rate, only to come three months later to the conclusion that the deals that that person won never churned because that person actually took a little bit more time educating the customer, making sure they sold to the right customer. I go even further. What if I can identify which clients generate really, really good other clients? For example, let's say that Tamaya is one of our clients and Tamaya puts me in front of this room and you folks are really, uh, really good. A few of you become really good clients of ours. Then Tamaya is the one that I wanna know. If I know that all the way up front here, wouldn't I be willing to spend a little bit more money on developing a lead like Tamaya versus XYZ lead? With data, I can tell, I can find out. I can learn which one churns and where they came from. And that means that I can spend more money on that MQL or SQL, whatever you want to call it. The importance of data. Now, I wrote um, a book on this topic and to my not liking, 80% of math were, were pulled out because I went nuts on the math sites. I went geometric progression. A friend of mine uh, is um, a scientist at NASA. She loves you. She's all like, oh, this is freaking awesome, right? And she go like, and then, you know, like everybody else go like, dude, nobody, you went, you went like um, Michael J. Fox in, uh, in Back to the Future. You went, I don't know if you guys remember when he goes nuts with the guitar. You went nuts on this. Okay, let me give you the simplicity of this. If you close a sale, any salesperson that has a $10 million target, they do primarily something the following. I'm gonna get $4 million from the East Coast, right? I'm gonna get like $3 million from the West Coast. Four from the East, three from the West, and row, rest of the world, I'm gonna get three. I got four, three, and three. What do I do? What the mathematical arithmetic function that I'm using to get to 10? Four, blah, 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 three, blah, 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 three equals which, which arithmetic am I using? Addition. Almost every part of every organization uses additions. Oh, I need 2,000 leads. 1,000 are gonna come from the website, 400 are gonna come from our event, 300 are gonna come from a content campaign. I add it all up, look what I got, 2,000. That's unfortunately not how customers work because if I go from left to right, all this conversion rate or multiplication. This means that down here I have an exponential impact. That exponential impact on a monthly subscription rate, including if you're selling shoes and you want to sell more shoes to the same customer, create what we call a compound impact. Compound impact means what I win this month actually will impact my next month to the nth degree. 1% down here, as they say, 1% improvement every day equals an incredible improvement. Compound impact. Exponential impact and compound impact. Now, don't get me wrong, compound impact has a function of exponential impact in it. If you want to run a $20 million company, you better know the math. And I hate to tell you, but after hundreds and hundreds of companies, it is shocking how many people actually do not know the full math of their business model. And I'm not speaking to you right now, whoever you are in the audience. Ooh, did that hurt? Yes, that hurt. This is the case. Because in the end, here's what we're doing, and this is why I'm so passionate about this. Folks, in the end, the people we blame because we don't do this is the 26-year-old brand new millennial SDR that is in the role and we tell them, oh, you didn't do your job right. We fired them three times and they have no more career in sales. 
That's what we currently are doing in many of these organizations. And I choose to, to think different. Okay, in this case, I show you the simple math. 10% improvement across seven of these steps equals double the sales. Do it, 1.1 to the power of seven equals 1.95. I go, it's not exactly two, I get it. <laughs> yeah, when I have younger people in the audience, they've already figured this out, so I know that that one is coming somewhere. Later. Duck, duck, okay? <laughs> 10% improvement across seven moments. That means, think about this, to double my sales, I do not need to double my revenue, or I do not need to double my amount of leads. That's the wrong mentality. I need to make sure that conversion rate number two and three and four each improve by 10%. So my win rate doesn't need to double. My price that I close doesn't need to double. I don't need to have twice as many sales teams, salespeople. All I need is, can we move our conversion rate, win rate up? from 20% to 22%. Can we move up our conversion rate from MQL from 30% to 33%? If I do that seven times, I get double revenue. Every time. Now, if I go to an individual part of the company and say, you know what, look, we're gonna give you two extra people, we're gonna give you these tools, we're gonna give you all this enablement, does that help you to improve by 10%? They say, yes, that will help, that's meaningful, that I can do. But to double the amount of MQLs overnight, that unfortunately is not a realistic point of view that we can look at. It essentially is what we see and what we see today is we're using it into an efficiency model, where previously we were just looking at a volume model. Working harder got us the trick, it won't uh, work any longer. What is the impact? 10% improvements across seven steps equals 2x. If you can only do five, then you need to improve it by 20%. Now, wonderful, learned something today, math, science, this is so great! <laughs> and he's drinking Red Bull. <laughs> if those of you have never seen me before, I, many of you will go like, oh no, no, I saw that fucker present the other day, it was good. <laughs> okay, see, that was Red Bull fueled. Okay, now you wanna go back and say, Jocko, I love whatever you talked about. But I need to implement this in a simple way. Because I can tell you, if I represent this back home, everybody goes like, dude, yeah, drop the Red Bull, and so on. Read the book, it's online, you know, like, that's fine. That's, fine. that's not the point. The point is I want something simple to give to you. And I was struggling with this for a while because, you know, like, I, 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 for years I did it, but I never really, like, I could never put my finger on how did I do this. And then I heard the story about Popsicle Moments. And the Popsicle moment is a story about a hotel in L.A., and this hotel is called the Magic Castle. The Magic Castle is a hotel that is a uh, modified 1950s apartment complex. This is the Magic Castle, painted wonderfully yellow. Would you believe that this hotel is rated the fourth best hotel out of 357 hotels in LA? with an average rating of 3,292 reviews, with an average rating of like 4.x stars. When you click on that, service has five stars among all those peoples. How did they get, how did this hotel, don't get me wrong, it's a great hotel, look, the bedroom, uh, you, yes, of course I would sleep a night over there. But if I would tell you that's the fourth best rated hotel, i go like, dude, are we kidding, right? Like, I'm on the, you know, like, where? Like, was it the painting, what was it? What gave that rating away, right? By the way, this card fell over, so I would ding you for that, no! What gave this hotel that rating? Well, this hotel had something that nobody else had. They have a Popsicle hotline. <laughs> now, what does the Popsicle hotline do? I tell you what it does. If you walk over to that phone, you pick up that phone, there's another person on the other side of the line that says, how many would you want in which taste? Watermelon, uh, strawberry, that will then be served to you poolside on a silver platter to the children who ordered it. By the way, this phone is children's height. It's like it hangs like this. <laughs> See, what they did is they say, like, look, we can beat people on all these other things. We are what we are, but we can create what we call a magical moment. We can create one moment that we are better at than anyone else. That's the moment that you're going to look at for your customer. What I want you to do is you find your seven moments that matter for your customer. Seven moments that you believe, you know what? 
actually, that is the moment in time where we interface with the customer. It really, really goes well. They're really important. For many of you, that is when they return, a product return. For some of you, that is, oh no, it's the first discovery call, the first time they visit the website. Create, figure out what these seven moments are and make each of those moments 10% better. That you can do. You double your sales. Now, we did this, and the reason why, you know, like I probably say that we're the number one rated um, sales consulting firm, sales and customer success consulting firm in the Bay Area. Not by a little, we are by quite a lot. And that is because we do this. What we look is we find these seven key moments. Here are a number of them. Reach out to people not because they're a fit, but reach out to them because they actually have a pain that you can solve. Not because they're a fit. Oh, let me talk to you because you are a CFO at a Fortune 500 company this size is not a good way to reach out to a person. But reaching out to a person saying, I noticed on your website, I visited and I saw that you have this issue. I came back to order my shoes and it keeps showing the pink shoes and I'm a man, so probably there's something wrong or not. Something's highly sophisticated, right? Either way, but something is going on, right? So we need to know that. Second, we don't qualify, we have a conversation. Qualification means I'm asking you, do you have budget? Are you the authority to buy? What is the need and what's the timeline? I, as a seller, get everything. You, as a person, as a customer, get nothing. That's not a conversation. That's just an interrogation. In order to have a conversation, this I need to tell you, you need to either hire really well on this or you need to teach people really well on this. Because most people cannot have a standard human-to-human -human conversation when it comes straight out of the box, AKA school. You need to actually teach this. Did you see that coming? It was good, right? Yeah, no, no, I'll do this. <laughs> Thursdays and Fridays. And so, <laughs> diagnose the situation, ask questions, don't pitch. Trade. If I look at a customer, you know, we look at, um, I meet many CEOs, uh, I have lunches with them, and I say, they say, can we bring anything? I'm like, yes, why don't you bring me the past 20 deals, 30 deals that you closed with the discount rate that was given? Oh, really, yeah. It's like it's a single metric I use, they show up, and I see that they close 20, 30 deals, and it says 20%, 20%, 30%, 25%, 15%, 20%, 20%, 30%. I go, just hire our company, I guarantee you we, can, you know, we can save you money right then and there. I calculate how much discount was given, how many deals they do, I'm like, we save you right away. So how can you see that so quickly? Well, when I see round dollar figures being discounting, I'm pretty sure that your team is you know, like not, nego not trained on negotiation. No, but we hired this excellent negotiating trader, yes. That's not practical implementation. If I tell you negotiation, most people think of hostage negotiation. People, salespeople can simply not negotiate. Oh yes, Jaco, but in the 1970s, I worked with a person who was the best negotiator. Yes, hero, put him up, put a glass in front of it and say only break glass in the case of an emergency. Everybody else needs to learn how to trade. Trade means if I give you 10%, I need to give this back to you. We write into our contracts that the customers have the right to survey other contracts. I do not give discounts in our company. I do not. Because I feel that if I give a discount, I'm disrespecting my previous 49 customers on that same, who bought the same thing. So I'm not gonna sit in front of you and give you a discount. Of course I understand that you gotta have a budget list. Which one of the issues would you like me to take away? Oh yeah, but that's not how we work. I get that, but if we do, we'll walk. Now, in order to do so, I put that in the contract that the customers have the right to survey, so I will not try to shimmy my way into it when I think a deal is really worth. Obviously, if you close a $10 million average deal size, suddenly, yes, you can break the rule as an exception, not as the norm. I want to see discount levels that go something like this, 4%, 7%, 6%, 3%, 4%, 7%. And you know what I'm going to ask in return? The one thing that is the most meaningful to me. Do you know anyone else that can benefit from a solution like we have? I didn't ask for a referral. I didn't even ask for an introduction or anything. I asked for, do you know anyone else who would benefit from a solution like ours? That is a trait. Now, I'll show you what we do. You, you can finish those thoughts there, what else we can do. We put that in, you know, we teach that in a very visual manner. We believe that if in sales you cannot visualize it, you cannot put your finger on it and tell where something goes wrong, a person will not be able to digest it. Go ahead, try to read any Wiley book. Try to publish through Wiley. Wiley will not publish until you have a minimum of 180 page. Yes, sir, but with, uh, sir, at Wiley, I only have like 30 pages of content. I don't know. Write another 150 pages, I don't care. It needs to have 180 pages of content, font size manipulated, otherwise we won't publish it. 
But I just want to explain how this works. Yeah, I'm sorry, we don't publish it. Therefore, reading sales books is not the best way for people to learn. We call this reverse classroom. I can teach you all day long on how to swim. We can have classrooms about it, we can do it, we can, we can do whatever we want. But sooner or later, somebody has to get their butt wet. You got to get into the, to the pool. What we do down here, we demonstrate and then we put them in a pool. We show visually how it works. The second thing that we do is extreme role play. Full contact sports sales is. That means that we actually have to perform role plays effectively. After role plays, we sit, we do buddy calls. Put another buddy on the call. I'm not going to sit next to you on the buddy call. I'm not. I'm not your buddy. Who's your buddy? Your colleague. Why? Because peer pressure is a stronger motivation to learn than a hierarchical pressure is from the top. So if your peer tells you, you did this wrong, you're going to, and you sit on the peer's call, if I tell you what you just did wrong, and then in the next hour you're sitting on my call, what's the one thing I for sure want to make that I'm not going to do wrong? What I just told you not to do wrong. <laughs> this is what we call reverse classroom, and in this reverse classroom it's role play, we call it 10, 20, 70, 10% takes place in the classroom using this, 20% extensive role play, 50 minutes a day, and 70% needs to happen actually with people on the call sitting to them. Doesn't mean you need to sit for the entire 60 to 30 minutes on the call. Even if you do 10, 50 minutes, it's fine. But they have to feel like we're improving. In this case, you can see, and this is one of our, our most popular blueprints, we, we, we show and share this publicly. Our YouTube channel gives you explanation of how this works, why you can do what, X or Y. And as somebody goes on the call, we go like, oh, so if I got it right, you have this situation, this situation, causing you this pain and this pain. Did I get that right? Yes. You're not the first. I hear this all the time. Uh, insert customer story. May I ask, how is this currently impacting your business? Not pitching, not going back to situational questions. This simple approach and making spin selling very practical is changing the young generation. This is working smarter. The alternative is that they got to go on 500 calls for the next 15 years and finally in year 10, 11, 12, they get it because the only other way to get it is repetition, 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 repetition. Through this, we're making sales way more accessible to the younger generation. In this case, we're looking at the growth path. Some of you indicated uh, that you are interested in customer success. I want to point you out that there's four processes that govern customer success, the upsell, the cross-sell. In this picture, we differentiate between the benefactor. If it's the same person who's buying the same solution, we call it a renewal. On the upper side, we have, are they buying the same impact or new impact? Do they want to get the same thing? If they want to get the same thing, same person, renewal. If it's the same person buying new stuff, upsell. If it's a new person buying new stuff, cross-sell. And if it's uh, a new person buying the existing stuff, resell. The most common thing that people forget is the resell. The resell is, hey, I sold to that person, then that person left, and I forgot to resell the solution to the person who, was, who, who took the job over, and as a result, that deal is gonna, gonna, gonna churn. This is, happens a lot in B2B companies because people forget this because they don't see the four processes. They only see, oh, it's renewal, and often they rolled into one as well. Cross-sell is the most complicated sell possible. As a person who sold previously $10 million to Disney, it went something like this. I sold that to Disney and go, like, dude, ESPN is part of, your, part of the parent company, right? He goes, like, yeah, Connecticut. Okay, let me go there. So I show up in Connecticut. We've won Disney. Your parent company is with us. You're going to buy our stuff, right? And this kid, the other side goes like, uh, no, what do you sell? We just picked another vendor on that. Not only am I not going to buy from you, I'm going to try to convince the parent company that they actually made a mistake with you because I want to resell all the stuff that I did because they made a mistake. We did a more advanced analysis. Cross-sell often involves political environments in B2B that you cannot handle with just a CSM who just picks up a phone call and says, hey, just heard from Mike that. I was wondering if you would be interested. I'm running at this at full speed at you right now. I know that many of you look and take pictures, and you, know, you go like, dang. Yes, folks, sales is a science. What you see down here is if I pick these four processes, they essentially, on the data-driven model, they create different loops. And these different loops, I have different metrics for. We know this. Now, maybe not every company works like that. I got that. Oh, your company works different. Great. Let me ask, where does your company work different? 
to us, sales is not just an art that is given to a person at, at, at the moment in time that they come into this world and go like, I'll give you, I grant you the gift of jaw. That means that you can now use your jaw in order to sell stuff. We can teach 90% of all people how to sell. The best salespeople we hear again and again are not people who've been properly trained on sales historically. These are people who have actually been historically trained on working with customers. Those end up being really, really good, successful salespeople. So if you go and you look for your next university grad to become a sales, if they haven't worked at Starbucks or in the service industry, you know, like, I just want to have a, a, a former Uber driver who can hold up a 4.8, 4.9 rating on Uber, who can actually hold a conversation with this as I come to a close. What is the science cu cu culture? It's a culture in which we blame the process for repetitive failure and not the people. Where we deploy a uniform methodology which is customer centric and where we make it data driven, where data tells us the truth. If you as a leader, CEO, founder, VP of sales, your gut tells you something is off, I still respect your gut. Go follow the data there. Go look the data in that in the area where you feel your gut. Second, why do we need it? We have to understand that your world, most world, buying and selling has radically changed. And if you do not change, you will no longer be the leader X or you will not see that growth that you expect. Why do we need it right now? Because what we're doing right now clearly is not working. Now, I'm very proud to announce that the third, uh, the fastest growing Silicon Valley company in uh, Shape Security is our customer, uh, Trip Actions. All these fast growing companies are our customers. And you may think, Jocko, you're bragging. I'm like, no, no, no. What you do not understand is that we ourselves have a process of training you. Because two, a week ago, I was training Trip Actions. I learned from you as a role play as much as I learned from you from me today. That means that we create these very short learning loops. We say, oh, that, that changed over there. What is the impact? Small improvement leads to big results. Don't try to tackle this entire world. Just pick seven key moments that matter most to your customer. Improve those. When you pick those moments, try to chart them out. Here's what happens in this call. Here's how a call goes, or here's how the experience goes. Visualize it. Because if I can put my finger and follow it, and then say, oh, you went wrong here, then people get it. With that, I'm going to open up for, am I, allow, am I okay to open up for questions?